that product has sold over a million units through TikTok shop and has also propelled it to the number one bestseller on Amazon in yeah. health and household. I think the products that I see do really well on TikTok shop are ones that are relatively low consideration products um, that are from a both a use case standpoint and a price point and a price point standpoint, as well as ones that are highly demonstrable. It's great to have you here. So you're you're from New York. You live here. I wouldn't offend a true New Yorker and say I'm from New York. I've just been here for 14 years now. Yeah. All right. Well, after 10 years, you're you become a New Yorker. Yeah. So they say. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's cool. I'm excited to have you. Uh, obviously, I, I don't know what the stats are. I was just looking at your Instagram, but you've built an impressive following um, on Instagram, TikTok, talking about brand strategy. How did that like? How did you really start thinking? Hey, I want to. I want to start putting content out and talking about these things. Yeah. So I got on TikTok from a brand standpoint. So there's a brand that I operate called Oklahoma Smokes. We started using TikTok towards the end of 2020. And that had been a great channel and is a great channel for our business. And so our organic content really works there. We were kind of early on in terms of being a brand on the channel. And so I got... I was creating content for that brand basically every single day. And I was studying what good brands are doing versus bad brands, like how to make content that resonates. And as I was operating that brand, I also operated this agency and I'm having all these conversations working with clients around branding, marketing, design, so on. And it's a series of topics that I really like talking about. So I'm like, okay, I generally kind of know what to do on TikTok. Let me see if this somewhat niche content works on TikTok. And so I just made a few videos, um, kind of given what I knew about how to create some of these videos and pretty quickly it started gaining traction. I was like, all right, let me keep going. Um, I want to say you definitely incepted uh, Emmett from Jin Lane yep. and Planes because I saw some of his recent videos and I was like, these are, these are sick. Did you guys have a conversation about that? Uh, yes. He messaged me. He's like, dude, I love your content. I want to make the same stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we've been trading notes a little bit, but his, his stuff is great too. Yeah, I like. I was like, this is a, a la Ashwin, but different flavors because he brings the creative direction perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely relevant to... So basically it started with um, Oklahoma Smokes being a platform and a, for, for you to basically like understand and learn TikTok. Exactly. Did you guys... So that was early days of TikTok too, 20. That was relatively early on TikTok. And we were just talking about how there are like layers of platform saturation that make it, you know, more difficult to um, reach, you know, new audiences organically and therefore, you know, paid comes into the equation more. Mm -hmm. um, so how has the platform changed? Just generally broad strokes. When we first got on the platform with Oklahoma Smokes, our first five videos, each one of them had half a million to a million and a half views. And they were just, here's the product. Here's three features of the product. And here's this trending sound that was working. And so pe people nowadays who haven't been on TikTok or haven't spent much time on TikTok, they're like, oh, it's just a place for like the sounds and the dances. And that was very much the ethos in 2018, 2019, 2020. And that was a lot of the content in the feed. So you could ride some of those trends, either as a personal creator or a brand and do very well. Today, you cannot do those things. It's actually almost shifted out of, there are trends and kind of memes happening on TikTok, but the bar for quality in terms of the content that you're putting out, and that doesn't mean high production value stuff. It just means there has to be far more substance or kind of interesting edits and interesting cuts in a way that captures people's attention. That is not just, here's the sound, here's my product. You need more... Uh basically foundation and structure to how you're going to create and grab attention million percent hooks you know different sort of visual cuts making sure you can get people to watch the body of your it's like it's direct response advertising exactly exactly um so ha has your growth stalled then on on tiktok on on oklahoma smokes because it's really interesting when i look at brand profiles i think to your point you could have just posted something that was on trend with the product and you're getting followers I don't think that's happening nearly as much as as more as, as it was to your point. And it's like how do brands stay relevant and create content that people actually want to follow? Correct. When it's a video-based platform. Yeah. So 
I think what's really important is that there are certain things that work for us. So for for example, with Oklahoma Smokes, there is a content style where we sample our product out in Washington Square Park and we're filming reactions that people have to the product. That's a content kind of pillar or style of content that consistently performs well. And so you know, when I say consistently performs well, maybe 20,000 views to a million views on, on some of these videos. And for a handful of brands, I know there's a couple of hard seltzer brands and food brands that do this kind of on the street sampling or kind of street style interviews. That content style works really well. It's not a content style that will work well for every single brand. Um, if you have a, a product that's say like a, um, a slime or you make sunglasses that have really cool, cool frames that are visually attention grabbing, then you might benefit a lot from like really fun, interesting product demos. And so it's very dependent on the product or service that you have that the type of you have to kind of tailor your your content strategy. Yeah, it, it makes sense. So basically brands need to be a lot more thoughtful about their content strategy and they need to make it more personal in some way. Yeah, I think the Kind of dovetailing with that, I think the biggest mistake that brands make is they say, we just need someone who gets TikTok and they'll they'll always say this kind of like, we just need this young person need who's like, TikToker. we need a TikToker. Can you hire someone who's like 22 for us to make content? I'm like, that's not what we need for this brand. You it's also know? risky too, though. What happens if someone matriculates out, you basically you know, lose the entire representation of what your brand was. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I always thought about that when there was a huge push and trend when people were like, oh shit, TikTok is a legitimate platform. We need to be on it. Um, let's just hire a TikToker. There are, you know, all these different agencies that would literally just install people. Mm -hmm. I think for some brands that's been really successful. Like I just had Steve from Olipop on the podcast who was mm -hmm. like, I brought, you know, someone in who really understood TikTok and could make our brand really relevant. Um, Olipop obviously has a ton of organic traction already. People want to see them on TikTok. I yeah. Um, for brands just starting out, it's you have to be a little bit more inventive. Of course. Um, and I think TikTok as a platform, I'd love to get your take on kind of what's happening in the, in the legislature and uh, legally and where you think that's going to go. We can speculate a little bit. But I also think it's going to be one of the most important platforms. Um, it, it already is, but in terms of gaining traction. And then as they perfect this commerce component with TikTok shop, um, I think brands who don't figure out a strategy for it are, are going to be, you know, losing a, a large chunk of their audience there. Yes. I mean, TikTok shop is a wormhole that I'm happy to, to let's, let's, we can, we can talk about, it. let's talk about, let's speculate real quick. Though. Yeah. So, you know, there was this period, um, I first built my audience, uh, kind of like personal brand audience on TikTok first. And I was not on Instagram until basically one year to date until last March, but I've been on TikTok for like, you know, 20 months, let's say. Um, when that first wave of, hey, TikTok's going to get banned started coming about, I was like, oh, I got to diversify a little bit. Let me start getting on Instagram and, and putting the content out there. So, so yeah, so so I think one thing that it is doing, which is maybe a benefit to anyone who dubs himself a creator or influencer, or anyone with an audience is, hey, this could be serious. So how do I diversify my audience, whether it's taking them to YouTube or Instagram or newsletters or so on? Um, what is the, what do I think is, I think there's some really smart commentary on what the assessment of the situation is on TikTok itself. I've seen some great videos about this. Um, I mean, there's two decision points. It you know has to then now go to um, the Senate and then see if it gets signed into signed into law. So two points there. And then the third point is, will they sell in six months if both of those things happen? I have no idea if all three of those things are going to happen, if they divest this arm of the business and sell it to a US-based company. Um, I can see, you know, I can understand certain reasons why the American government would not want TikTok, you know, in in, in the states. Um, but I mean, I I personally love it. Um, I love it too. I, I've been I've been going deep on TikTok shop. I think the I can understand the the, the rationale be between reciprocity and basically like saying, hey, we're not allowed to have any of our social networks in China, like we need either reciprocity or we're going to have this sort of, we make this sort of decision. 
I'll speculate. I think if it does go that far, I think they would sell off the U.S. business in some way and monetize that. It just seems like. Yeah, I think there's this, the flip side of that argument, people say they will never divest this part of the business. The American user base is only 10% of their global audience. They have over a billion users. And to that, it's like, okay, maybe from a percentage standpoint, we're a small percentage of the total global user base. But I would suspect we're probably the heaviest in terms of like potential dollars for consumption on the platform. I mean, the we American gotta, yeah. population just consumes yeah, we just a con- lot we're of product. The largest consumer market in the world. I mean, I was just at, at Prosper and, you know, TikTok shop was out in droves. They're obviously subsidizing so many of the purchases right now. Yep. They want to onboard as many brands as possible and and make that interaction from a commerce perspective like really sticky. Yep. Um, and, and I do think the way that they're integrating content uh, and commerce is it's a lot more compelling than when Instagram launched shop. A hundred percent. I'm curious to hear your take on on how you're thinking about strategies for brands and where TikTok shop makes sense. Um, we've spoken on, on this podcast about how you need to start with the fundamentals and organic yeah. before you can even approach it. It's not like Amazon in that respect. Yeah. Um, but we'd love to hear you opine on that. Yeah, I think the products that I see do really well on TikTok shop are ones that are relatively low consideration products um, that are from a both a use case standpoint and a price point and a price point standpoint, as well as ones that are highly demonstrable. So two examples that immediately come to mind. There is this product, there's this kind of selfie light that they're that they branded the Alex Earl light, you know, but it's like, it's, it's, it's any one of these ring lights. Right. But, but some brand just got on there and they're like, no, ours is the Alex Earl light, which is a really smart, a really, really smart strategy for selling a, just a regular selfie light on TikTok shop. So they call it the Alex Earl light. And then every one of these creators has this 20% affiliate to sell that product. And it is probably a $30 item. So you get six bucks on every sale and to demonstrate it, it's just like, I've tried every one of these lights. Here's my bathroom light. Now here's the Alex Earl light. And the second they turn on the Alex Earl light, their face looks beautiful. The shot looks beautiful. It is so instantly demonstrable. Every one of those videos that I see has like hundreds of thousands of millions yeah. of views, comments, saves, shares, et cetera. And that is so perfect for that economy of TikTok viewer because there's a good chance that they might be a creator and it's like, oh, want to be a creator and they just buy it. Let let me buy this 30 bucks. Um, So I've seen that. There's also this other product which is selling at this point tens of millions of dollars on TikTok shop uh, called Guru Nanda Oil. And Guru Nanda Oil, it's a coconut oil mix that is used for um, oil pulling. So like through your teeth, you swash it, swish it around for like 15 minutes. One of the claims is that it whitens your teeth. So I see all of these videos of these creators who are like, this, this was my teeth before, like look how white they are now. And then half of them, they're like super white, but it's like, I don't know, did you edit that? Or what was it actually the product here? Um, that product has sold over a million units through TikTok shop and has also propelled it to the number one bestseller on Amazon in yeah. health and household. And they You're are probably the number one TikTok shop uh, item as well. Yeah, I would, I would think so. I would think so. That's really interesting. So they're like, and that's like, these are like vanity products. Uh, yes, yes. Which is interesting. BK Beauty is another one. Um, so I think there's, there's vanity and beauty products that work really well. I've seen supplements work really well too. Um, it's kind of a question of, uh, also a question, and this goes back to the organic content, how what are the kind of compelling hooks that you can use for this product? So I've seen some kind of coffee supplements that like help boost guys' testosterone, let's say, and mm-hmm. and I'll see all of this content that are kind of TikTok shop ads for them. And it's like, you know, people who, you know, like testosterone clinics, like don't want you to know about this, yeah. you know, coffee brand. And it's, it's somewhat similar to what you might see in kind of hook testing on Facebook, just done on TikTok organically. Um, and it's, it's kind of working. Do you do, so I, I'm curious, uh, in terms of, you know, other people being able to manufacture and build up to that and like how they get the strategy really right. So for, um, any of those brands that you just mentioned, um, their TikTok, like to tell me about if you, if you can speak on it, 
Like, is their organic strategy already dialed and then they're leveraging affiliates and influencers? Are these ads coming directly from the brand themselves? Let's, let's talk about that. Yes. So in most of these instances, the organic is already dialed um, in that they've had some presence on the platform for quite some time, maybe have whatever, 25, 50, 100,000 followers. Um, however, what I think they do a really good job with is either seeding the product in, in a mass way to creators who are interested in creating content on shop. Um, and, and it's almost at that point, their own organic owned and operated organic channel matters much less because they have this universe of creators just who are incentivized, right? It's like perfect, beautiful incentive alignment. I'm going to talk about this product that I got for free, or even if I bought it, but I'm going to make money off of it yeah. directly. Yeah. No, that's why affiliate programs on a marketplace. And if you have this like limited friction in terms of you can create content, you're posting it directly on the platform and then there's commerce in the platform and it's trackable one-to-one -one is I think really powerful for this particular platform, especially because now there are more creators than ever because of, you know, the, the power that we have to just reach people organically, which TikTok really pioneered uh, yeah. before Amazon, uh, before Instagram. 100%. Um, I want to talk about creators because 33% um, of Instagram users have over 10,000 followers um, and 7% have over 50K. And I think once you cross that threshold, and that's, uh, I have it written down over here, it's 98 million accounts. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously a lot of, uh, company and 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 uh, other sort of pages that aren't necessarily people, but a large percentage of of those people are, you know, humans, and they're just creating content like yourself, um, and they inevitably start thinking about monetization, um, and launching products or service are a natural like that's where your head goes. I think that's a natural evolution, and if you're not a massive influencer like an Amber Chamberlain or um, Mr. Beast you know, you really have to put a lot of time into building a, a product that actually has value and, you know, can actually sell. And I think that's a whole different domain for creators because in many instances, uh, they're not necessarily business people who understand operations and logistics and supply chain. There's a whole economy of tech and services helping them do that. Mm -hmm. But I want to know in your particular uh, situation in case, like, how has your psychology changed as your uh, own personal page really taken off um, about monetization? Like what were, what were the different inflection points? Um, and then I have a couple of other questions that I'll, I'll hold, but based on your post today, actually regarding your audience, how many of them aren't on TikTok, which yeah. is so interesting. Yep. Um, but let's just talk about your journey for a bit and, and creator monetization. Yeah, I think creator monetization is an interesting one because like you said, a creator gets to a certain size and they're like, the easiest thing is like, I'm going to make merch, right? I have 500,000 followers, I'm going to make merch or I'm going to make XYZ CPG product and you see creators at kind of these minor scales doing this. And then you also see large celebrities doing this and you see a lot of like failed celebrity backed brands. And I think the common thread um, between the person who's has a following of 200,000 people who's like, I'm going to make and sell candles to them versus a huge celebrity who's like, I'm going to make a new vodka brand is if it is not, if, if there is not something, if it's not something that your audience knows you for or finds, and, and this is the kind of like co conversation around authenticity, if it's not authentic to who you are and what you talk about, it doesn't make sense. So if I look at my audience right now, it's, and this is just one piece of the problem. The second piece of the problem is the actual operations of scaling and growing those businesses and so much more than just, hey, I'm going to post it on my Instagram feed um, and hope that drives a ton of sales. If I look at my audience right now, you know, the type of content I create is really around branding and marketing and design for like, consumer brands and, and, and products. If I were to launch a like really nice hoodie I don't know, maybe I'd sell 10 of them. It just wouldn't align with the type of content you make. Yeah, or I mean, I wear a hat every, in, every day in every video. 
I don't know. People be like, what does he know about hats <laughs> outside of just wearing them? You know, has he done something interesting there? And so it doesn't make sense. But for me, it's kind of like my content is around ideas and information. And so, you know, I one kind of, so I have had this agency. So it leads to a lot of work for the agency. It leads to a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultation calls. Um, I put together a course on TikTok short form organic for brands because that's also work that I do. So it's like that's a product yeah. that I can sell that people are like, of course, like that makes so much sense. Yeah. I think for you and uh, B2B influencers are becoming a huge thing. Becoming a thing, yeah. Because of this, uh, services and digital products make a lot of sense. And you see these creators uh, building serious businesses, multi-million dollar businesses with one employee, you know? Yeah. And I think that's going to be a, a serious trend that, that continues. Um, and that's where you see a lot of, I think CEOs, even like myself, someone like Emmett, who's like, I should, there's a huge advantage, uh, to building in public and creating meaningful content. It's, it's an asset. Yes. Um, so I, I would, I would, I'm, I'm curious, like, most of the TikToks, let's fo let's focus on like creators though, not necessarily yeah. B2B influencers. Sure. Creators on TikTok though, where where do you see that inflection point? Because I've seen so many creators uh, fail at introducing products and yeah. spending a ton of work on creating the apparel line or whatever it is. Um, what's your advice really? So I think that, you know, a creator who is launching, so 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 one, it's kind of, can I launch a product that is that fits so well with what my audience knows me for? So an example of this is um, one of the founders of Bloom. It's a husband-wife couple, but Mari is one of the founders of Bloom. She was on Instagram prior. She's an audience of about a million people. She's been been on Instagram and she's documented since day one her weight loss journey, going from like 250 pounds to like 115 pounds or something, and all of her health issues and complications. And she was that was her profile on Instagram. And so when she launched Bloom, it was this like detox, gut blo bloating, like you know, supplement, this powdered green supplement that helps address all of these issues that was such a natural fit for what her audience looked to her for, you know, health and wellness advice from someone who I've seen in public make this transition themselves. And it's like, hey, this is a kind of culmination of everything that I was doing. So there's a product that's a great fit for that creator. Now, they also had it set up right in such a way where, you know, the they knew from a operational standpoint everything else that they needed to do from a retail standpoint retail standpoint from a paid marketing standpoint from a supply chain standpoint and got the right people involved to actually find success with that business um so so one is kind of really making sure that you know that your audience knows you for something you can have an audience of 10 million people but if your content style is just reaction clips to viral videos, your audience actually has no idea who you are or why it would make sense for you to launch a certain product. But sometimes those creators say, well, I have 10, you know, 10 million yeah. followers, you get a couple million views on each one. Um, so I'm going to launch a candle brand or a coffee brand and I'm going to open up my videos with that. And it's like, well, why is anyone going to buy coffee from you? Yeah. You know, just it's a because cheap it's, advertisement, basically. Yeah, it, it, it's a cheap ad and it, it's going to dilute your core content because you're going to keep plugging that and people aren't really going to buy the product. And um, yeah, that's a really interesting point. So basically you've built up uh, a skill for, you know, having an audience or getting attention, but if you don't diversify in some way, it's going to be hard to launch a product. So you kind of need to, you need to think about both together. You have to think about both. I mean, here's here's a great one. Are you familiar with Something Navy? Mm -mm. So Something Navy is this big creator, like millennial mother creator, Ariel Charnas. She had you know a couple million followers on on Instagram. My wife was like a huge fan of of her content. Lived in New York City, just like chic lifestyle, you know, just like a great lifestyle content creator. She launched a brand, and she was like very into fashion and like looked really good all of the time, and built this kind of following around this, and then launched this brand called Something Navy, kind of eponymous brand, um, called Something Navy. In its first year, kind of like grew to like twenty four million bucks, That's and it's crazy. Wait, how big was your following? crazy. I think like she had a couple million followers, but then 
what you'd find is in all of her, she was making these pieces. And then the first thing that my wife would say is like, the fit isn't right. Or like, that doesn't look right. It's like not up to par with all the stuff that she wears. And then in all of her content, she's never wearing her own clothes. Yeah. She's wearing the stuff that's like a $3,000 blouse and a $2,000 thing. And she's like, never, it's, it, it, there wasn't an authentic, it, it was an authentic fit in creating a fashion line, poorly. but it's like executed poorly. Well, and it sounds like the product was executed poorly, but like it would be something that maybe fit into the, the style of content she had, but yeah, that's but, why people but, bought it. But it's almost like she didn't believe in it yeah. enough to even support it herself. And then it went to nothing. They were trying to sell it for a dollar, you know, yeah. and it's like they well, haven't. That's okay. That's exactly what I'm talking about where like you private label something is a great example. Yeah. You're like you private label something and you're just like, We've worked with a number of different creators who are like, you know, we've worked with top of the top, like Dwayne Johnson, top, top, you know, A-list celebrities. And then we've worked with creators who are in this niche where they have, they have audience, they have engagement, but then they'll, they make the step to moving towards products and they'll private label something because it's easier and it just doesn't fit. People don't give a shit, basically. People don't give a shit, and people can tell. They can tell. It's people a, it's can a money tell grab. when things are dialed, like yeah. phoned in. Now, something like Summer Friday is very well executed, though. And I think, well, this is this is what you know. I'm I'm just thinking through this, talking to you for launching an actual product. I think, e despite this economy of all these different tools to help people launch things, it's hard to develop something really good. You got to put a lot of time and attention. You have to become an entrepreneur to build a product. Yeah. Um, and I think in that, in that respect, people like you who are creating content about, you know, services or, you know, can I have some sort of digital product around courses? Like you can scale a lot faster. So I think that's, that's interesting. Yeah. You, you know, the, the best kind of, I saw this comment somewhere out there. Uh, someone was talking about, so the Demelios have a footwear brand yeah. and someone's like, what people are just kind of like, what is this footwear brand? I don't know what the numbers are on the footwear brand, but I can't imagine it's like ripping astronomically. And, um, I remember watching this video where someone was talking about like, Hey, we're on like the downfall of the Demelios. And one of the most liked comments in that, that was a viral video. One of the most liked comments had like 50,000 likes was like, what they should have done is actually started a dance studio and that would have had lines around the block forever because it's so like, that's what they got popular for. That's what they were good at. That's what they knew. And it's like, okay, if I'm, you know, if the, if the comp to me is like, okay, I'm sharing ideas. Let me put together a course. Them is like, Hey, they're dancing. They're good at dancing. Okay. What if you had a dance studio or By a class way, or something for you, this would be a really interesting idea in terms of what sort of venture studio would, a make a lot of money and be really valuable to these creators is mm -hmm. figuring out like what's most authentic to what them. works for them. Yeah. 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 Cause like that idea question. would be, you know, they would have a hundred percent capacity line out the door. Like you're talking about all the time. Um, and that would just be one business unit for them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it's dangerous. Don't give me ideas of stuff to do. Plates <laughs> full right now, <laughs> but I like that. Right. I like that a lot. Um, so, okay. I was checking out your Instagram. I saw, 66% of your followers or whoever responded to that, they're not on TikTok? Yeah. So Okay, someone's lying somewhere. Okay, it's a, so TikTok says half of Americans are on TikTok. They spend 56 minutes a day on it. Um, most used app. You right? know, m m most, most used app. And so I put up this poll on my Instagram and I say, quick, quick check, like, how many of you, how often do you use TikTok? And it was like, never, a few times a month, a few times a week, and then daily. Mm -hmm. And 66% said never. And then I got a lot of DMs saying, well, your audience on Instagram is older. So there's like a, a few things. So, so then I- misconception. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of misconceptions because now also TikTok says, hey, our largest demographic is actually older well, the, than- The demographics were identical. The demographics were identical. Yeah. So I shared my TikTok stats and my Instagram stats and the demographics were exactly identical. Um, so something somewhere is like incorrect. <laughs> Um, so your demo, I feel like it's, it's like, I mean, actually just, just tell me <laughs> what is your demo? So from a, um, from kind of like audience stats standpoint or who is the type of person yeah, the that type follows of person that, that's following you? I feel like they're educated and yeah. So, so, so yes, yes, definitely. So it's interesting. They kind of fall in two buckets. So one, there is this audience of people who work in marketing or branding or operate a brand themselves. That is actually not the majority of follower that I have. The majority of follower I have is like people who just work in different things, but have now found 
these smaller nuances of marketing and branding quite interesting to them. And so they're like, I just follow along because like, interesting to know. Um, <laughs> you know, like sometimes I'll get this message. <laughs> I got this message the other day from uh, one of my one of my buddies who's a skin cancer surgeon. And we were in a personal Instagram like post together. And one of his friends from med school was like, dude, how do you know that guy, Ashlyn? And he was like, oh, he's like a close he's friend. He's, he's a close friend of mine. And he was like, that's one of my favorite Instagram follows. And this guy is like a skin cancer surgeon somewhere <laughs> in like Ohio, you know? It's like, why does he follow me? You know? And he, he just found like there was a kernel of something that he sunk his teeth into. And for well, whatever reason, that's, it's interesting. I think that's what you're doing is beautiful. And that's one of the beautiful parts of the internet is like you can find things that really interest you and, you know. At least your content's educating. You know what I'm saying? There's yeah, thank you. Worst things to follow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's interesting. And then the other half, um, not the people who are like, oh, good to know. Like, are they in uh, like in the creative world? Yeah, very much in the creative world. Um, so a lot of people who work in marketing and a lot of people who operate brands, a kind of maybe not on the marketing side, but they're an operator of a brand does hundred grand a year all the way up to. 500 million bucks a year. And um, so your agency, what sort of what sort of services? Uh, you told me briefly, but... Yes. So we really work with consumer brands at the early stage going from idea to launch. So they'll come to us, say, hey, we are thinking about launching a new like, super high clean protein supplement. Um, but we need help with everything from like understanding the, the landscape, understanding what the positioning opportunity is, then how do we translate that into a brand that's going to resonate packaging design, digital design, development, copywriting. And, and you guys are doing um, obviously all of the brand strategy, but visual identity work as well. Correct. Packaging, website design. Correct. Okay. That's incredible. Um, I... I'm curious to know just some of the projects you're working on right now. Yeah. So right now we are working on a new non-alcoholic sparkling wine. So that is a super interesting category. Like a Gia type? A lot of growth. Um, yeah. So so there's this also this, there's this category of wine proxies. Okay. And then there's categories of wines that are have been de-alcoholized. So it's in the de -alcoholized. it's in the de-alc category. Um so we're working on a product there, and then we're also working on a supplement, a drinkable supplement brand. So think like kind of five-hour energy shot, mm -hmm. but it's built with, made with supplements. Is your goal with the agency, are you trying to, um, are you trying to scale the business? Are you trying to expand? Tell us a little bit more about like uh, agency life. Yeah. So myself and my partners kind of fell into the agency everyone man you know <laughs> and then you do it and you you have this idea we had this idea we were in the world of building consumer software before and uh we started this agency because we had worked on a couple of consumer software brands we'd raise some money for them like built them to a certain scale and we're like we're just like this good like design engineering product team like let's keep building stuff on the side as we like encounter problems and to pay the bills we'll like take on contract work and so we initially started with working in the consumer software space or like B2B software space, um, designing UI and developing front end experiences. And then maybe in 2018, 2019, one of our buddies came to us and he's like, Hey, I'm launching this candle brand. I need help with branding, Shopify design, development, et cetera. Do you guys do that? We're like, not really, but we're good enough at design. We'll help you figure it out. So we figure it out with him. We do a good job there. That brand was very successful in their first year, and then he was really plugged into the space, so a lot more work came. And um, as I'm sure you know, it's like work begets work, right? You do a good job for one client, they refer you out, refer you out. So then we kind of shifted into the space of kind of brand identity, working with these consumer brands. But I think there is, we I really like playing in this space. I don't want to be in a position where I'm not doing the work and I'm managing the growth of an agency. Yeah. Um, and so that's just a kind of personal, like we kind of like the idea of remaining kind of like very boutique working on specific projects. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it for that's us. The, like, that's a really important decision. I think anyone starting an agency, like I think you need to have that intention going into it because if you're like, hey, I want to be in the man managerial spot where I'm like scaling and you know, you're know you adding headcount, which is the position I'm in right now, you need to develop systems and processes and like figure out how to productize whatever yeah. you're going to offer yes and then it's just a question of 
you know, how quickly you can generate demand and, and scale and make sure you do good work. Yeah. You know, you're at a point, I think, where you can affect a lot of change on, on, the, on the clients that, that you work with, develop more meaningful relationships. And Yeah, I think so. I think so much of the work around positioning, positioning a new brand, coming up with the creative vision for the brand, it's a little bit hard to scale, I think. Um, where you know some creative work it's almost hard to productize a little bit um where you know having a conversation with a client recently and he was like what does the process look like for arriving in a name for a brand and i'm like it's a lot of work and then it's it just comes to us one day you know when we're just walking around or in the shower like i can't i can't train someone i can say here are the what i think the parameters of a good name look like and here's a peek into how i arrive at it but I don't know how I train someone to do that and, and, and kind of do that well. So um, I think there are some types of services that are maybe a little bit harder to scale. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a question what you want certain things that are super nuanced. So at Darkroom, we have like uh, maybe like 20 to 30 different services that we offer. Every single one. Like we've gotten to a place because we used to not necessarily spend so much time on like scoping and like, training and like that is literally your secret sauce as an agency so now the 20 i mean for for the type of agency we are but like these 20 scopes they all have like really specific deliverables processes they're linked to trainings for each of the resources that are on them yep um that's what's that's what's allowing us to grow but there are certain subsects of of services usually mostly strategy Mm -hmm. that are impossible to like define deliverables for we have a growth strategy service that's like ongoing it's more strategic leadership support for growth teams yep and it's like you just it's kind of like you need this uh i don't know what to say (laughs) i'm kind of a part of the team right now and i'm gonna help you grow this business but i can't bullet it for you yeah one of our one of our clients i was actually having this conversation yesterday with uh one of our directors of growth who's a brilliant individual like one of the one of the smartest minds in the space um we were talking about one of our our clients they do baby food and they like really would benefit and there's only she only has like a certain time allocation on the account and we're like trying to tell them we like you know we're trying to tell them we're like hey this is something you need like and these are all the reasons why but like it's totally different than us managing your retention marketing or your ad program where you're getting these creative deliverables every yep. month um and i think when you're a founder like yourself um, and you have a reputation, right? In your case, you have a following. Like people know your brain because of the content. Mm-hmm. You have a much easier time selling those services, mm-hmm. which is why, because they trust you, right? And I think that's why so many uh, so many founders and so many people in the B2B, serv- in, the, in the services space are trying, they're, they're realizing, yeah. hey, this is really important. And I think that's why your message is really hitting home right now. Yeah, I think it's, I, I mean, I say this all the time, like it changed the trajectory of the agency, changed the trajectory of the how we even have conversations. Like, give the, us a, give us a sense of like what that looks like. Like, how has it changed lead and lead lead gen for you guys? So, in prior to creating content, there was always this question of like, where does the next project come from? The type of work that we do, it's not really kind of long-term retainer-based work. We're getting the brands to launch, and then once they need to start running paid, they might come to you guys or like any number of of businesses that do a lot of paid work and maybe some ongoing like CRO work and testing. And here and there, they'll come back and we'll do these kind of one-off projects, but it's really like building the foundation to launch this brand. So you're kind of playing this game of kind of new customer acquisition. So you're hoping, hey, well, we'll put this work out there, we'll talk about it, and then maybe get some referrals or our last client was super happy with us. Let's just like ping his network or like intermittently like send updates to our, you know, 50 person email list saying, Hey, if we're, we're, we have availability for projects. Surprising by the way, why haven't you explored newsletter or uh, as a channel? So I have a newsletter that is just around TikTok organic content for brands. Okay. Um, and I just have a kind of newsletter flow for that, that kind of leads into the course. So you're just, you're a lot more comfortable creating TikTok style, this TikTok style videos. Like some people like writing, you know what I mean? Everyone I think has a different medium. One of my really good friends, his uh, fiance now actually, uh, her name is Kate. She's 
the runner girl on TikTok like, mm-hmm. in New York City. Yes, 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 of course. Yeah, and people would just be like, you're the runner girl. Like, that's how she's yeah, yeah, yeah. in New York. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, it just didn't happen um, before TikTok. There's like three runners, New York runners that I just know. And like Kate's, Kate's one of them. Yeah. Um, it's funny. So, okay, most of your content centers around like rebrands, like packaging, um, when brands get things right, when they get things wrong. Um, I think a lot of early stage businesses, it's so important to obviously like get the aesthetics of your, of your product. Right. And I think there's a lot more money on the line with rebrands actually for, you know, I was just looking at your Tropicana Tropicana example. Um, Mm -hmm. and there's a whole, you know, I think data science around that. Mm -hmm. Talk, talk us through, like, I'm curious if you have a thought about like what makes a brand like good, like, what do you look for? Do you have any frameworks that you kind of go back to? Um, when you're in the creative process, yeah, that's a. I know it's a very broad question. It's a it's a loaded question. So I think we we use this term like brand loosely, and I think for people who are not designing or in like the branding agency world, most people when they say brand, like we're referring to the packaging, we're referring to like packaging design. You know, the logo. It's like I love the the branding of it, and it's like I just love the box of it. You know, I love like Last Crumbs box. Um. And so, so I'll often just like indulge that because I don't want to like create this unnecessary like distinction. If the average person says, Hey, that's like the Pepsi can is like the Pepsi brand. I'm like, okay, that's how I'm going to talk about it. Right. Pepsi rebranded. Here's like the new look, but I think there's so much more to an entire brand, right? All of their communication touch points across social, across advertising, across activations and so on. And like, you, you know, you understand this that it's like this kind of encompassing encompassing pieces is is the brand so there's so i guess my question is there's things that i think that are good like good packaging tenants or like a good framework for like good packaging and then i think there's a bigger question around like is there a tenant or framework for good brand and so yeah i guess which one did which one should we talk about let's talk about packaging i think because most of the recent videos that i've seen you develop yeah focus a lot on visual identity and the things that make people remember your brand. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. Yeah. So I think the most important question that a brand needs to ask when they are going to, when they're designing their packaging and kind of designing their, their brand and aesthetic is what is their distribution channel? And so for some brands, the distribution channel may right off the bat be retail. Maybe you sell alcohol product yeah. and um, it's going to be retail. You're not really going to build this like D to C business, like very painful to even try to figure out how to do that. So, okay, we're going to be selling in retail. Okay. What kind of stores are you going to sell in? Are you going to sell initially in specialty or are you going to sell like mass market, total wines and spirits, BevMo, et cetera? Just n- making some of these distinctions of what you think is possible at first is important so that you can understand where your product sits on shelves. Because for a lot of the consumer, your point of discovery is going to be on shelves. So how are we standing out relative to the competition in that space on the shelf? Um, But also what are we, how clearly are we communicating to people about what our product is about? And so one of the kind of gripes that I've had in the past is, you know, like the aesthetic of all of the D to C brands, like from the era of like 20, yeah, the, 20 the bland era. Yeah, it's a kind of bland era, right? It's like super like minimalist packaging, just like has this fun like font on it, like says something. But it's like I look at it, I'm like, what? I was like, what's in there? Yeah. I have no idea what's in there. And and that's okay to the degree in which you build the entire business just D to C because you do all of the communication elsewhere. You do the communication on the website, on the Facebook ad, on the Instagram ad, on the social channels. So so the packaging itself doesn't have to communicate a whole lot. But you see this happening for a lot of these brands that were like DTC first, built that kind of packaging, then get into retail. They're like, oh shit, it's not retail ready because we're not communicating anything about our product to the shopper that's like scanning a hundred things and like making these split second decisions. So you see packaging, like these packaging changes have to change pretty dramatically to even like find some success on the retail side. Such so, a good point. So starting with distribution and where you're going to sell, I think is like the foundational question of like what's important. Then it's the question of like information hierarchy. Then we have these other pieces of like what feelings are we commu- Are we like premium? Are we mass market? Are we this? Are we that? Um, 
what kind of call outs do we want to have? It's a really good point uh, just on the distribution side because I witnessed it firsthand when I think when direct consumer was so in vogue because of like the perceived benefits of, you know, cutting out the middleman and the, re- and the retailers, um, how many CPG brands where like in hindsight, it's so obvious that the product was going to be bought, you know, in the store, like beverage is a great example. Yep. And people tried to optimize for D to C and the unit economics just didn't end up working. Yes. And they needed to kind of traverse. Such an important point that I think is also forgotten is you have to consider what existing consumer behaviors are for that product category. And if it's something, if it's a type of product that is maybe an impulse purchase and you just need it, this it's either an impulse purchase or convenience matters so much and you need it kind of same day. Um, here's a great example is next day, like, uh, next the morning after pill like next day contraceptive device right that'll never be really like a d to c business because like oh shit like i i need this thing (laughs) i need this thing right now so it's like you have to be in every single cvs right and it's like you can't fight that like core consumer need and consumer behavior for purchasing that type of product um and and there are categories where that is true and there's categories where it's a little bit more flexible and i think just putting some critical thought into that so you don't just fall into the thinking that like, oh, D to C is hot. I can go build D to C. What, what sort of brands do, are you looking at right now and like looking up to and or or are seeing that are coming up and you're like, they're, they're crushing it? You know, it's, I mean, one brand I was just having a conversation about like Oats Overnight is crushing it. Yeah. They are crushing it. And they're actually doing a really interesting job building a D, predominantly D to C business. Um, they have this Facebook group with like, 200,000 people in it just talking about like oats recipes and like health and wellness and like I I just don't get it right (laughs) but it's like it's happening in spades they built a super strong business and what I like about that actually is the name is obviously like so stupidly simple packaging is not anything special it's not like this hot brand that you'd see at like pop-up grocer or like any of these like aesthetic Space. It's not like an aesthetic brand, but it's like a really good business. And there is this like category of, I think these brands that hit maybe like more mass market and kind of like don't enter the scenes of like New York and LA, like Erewhon's, like people who are like super into like CPG and D2C and branding and all of that stuff that are just like really robust, great businesses. And then on the flip side, you see ones that are like super hyped then in like three years they're declaring bankruptcy. It's yeah. like, oh shit.